Welcome, all you happy warriors, and uh, also other visitors who are not yet happy warriors to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where I, your rabbi, solemnly dedicates myself to revealing for you how the world really works. Thanks for being part of the show, and thank you for doing such great work in helping to promote the show and tell other people about it. I must confess to getting a completely uh, childish um, thrill and, um, and, and, and delight in watching the download numbers grow as I see uh, the audience of this show growing and spreading absolutely everywhere. Uh, we've got um, somebody listening in the Netherlands who is from Peru, and uh, that person wrote and uh, and spoke to me. Received several letters uh, lately from folks listening in South Africa, and uh, I get a real kick out of that because I was born on the African continent, and uh, so I uh, I look forward to meeting all of you on some forthcoming trip uh, back to Africa, and uh, many of you, uh, I've received letters this last week from some of you in Canada, um, somebody in Spain, uh, we've got quite a bunch of people listening in Brazil, thank you all of you in Brazil, I know several of you by name, because I've heard from you, but uh, I know there are many more, and uh, so the pins on my map just keep growing in density, and while there are still a few countries that do not yet have any pins, um, that number is shrinking, which <laughs> gives me a lot of fun. What can I say? Uh, it really does. Now, uh, just recently, on February the 23rd of the year 2021, and I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, and, and it would appear to be, I mean, people listen to these podcasts um, in some cases, years after I recorded them. And that's why I try to make sure that I talk about ideas that are always true, always going to be true, and are always true everywhere. And so uh, uh, I, I give a mention to this just in case somebody wants to go and see it. It's, it's, it's really, it's an absurd article, New York Times. Uh, February 23rd, 2021, and um, it's written, it's called Humans Are Animals, Let's Get Over It, and I'm certainly not going to read the whole thing, <clears throat> but his basic point is that there's no difference between human and humans and animals, or he corrects himself and says, well, there are some differences between human and animals, but they're not as big as the differences between one animal and another animal. You know, the difference between a whale and a baboon is much bigger than the difference between a, a human and an animal. And so uh, humans and animals are basically exactly the same thing. And, uh, and we have to recognize this. He says, you know, don't think that uh, you're that different from a squirrel. A squirrel might climb trees better than you do, but um, that you know there are other there are other differences, but nothing that suggests you are a completely different species. Um, like a squirrel, he's like a squirrel. I have eyes and ears, scurry about on the ground, and occasionally climb a tree. One of us does this better than the other does. Our shared qualities are the fact that we are both hairy. Uh, we both have eyes, or we poop. If you don't mind, you pardon me. This has to be put in, of course. Um, and he said, all of this is just dis disconcerting because if I'm an immortal being created in the image of God and the squirrel is just a physical organism, a bundle of instincts, then how can all this be? And, uh, and he finishes, you know, with that flourish that suggests, wow, I've proven my point. Absolutely done. Um, and it, it, this is his piece. It, it, it's a long piece published in a, in a paper, which, uh, still retains an utterly undeserved reputation for excellence, but uh, but there it is. Um, uh, and then he says, "Now here's the trouble." He says, "When you people 
insist, meaning us religious people, meaning me, when, when you insist on drawing a distinction between people and animals, what you really are doing is you are enabling people to draw distinctions between some humans and other humans. And so it's because of you, it's because of you, Bible-believing, God-believing Jews and Christians, that's why we still have, and he says, this is a useful justification for colonialism, slavery, and racism. You get it? So um, uh, I, because I see a difference between people and animals, that makes me move to the next level of there's a difference between some people and other people, and therefore I am the one who justifies colonialism, slavery, and racism. This is the kind of thing this uh, he goes on about. Um, and, uh, oh, um, I'm not, you know, I don't think I'm going to read any more of it because I've, I've given you the basic gist of it. Um, he finished coming to his end. He says, uh, this dualistic view that there's animals and people is a disaster, um, and um, uh, and it's, it's responsible for so many of the problems of society. Um, uh, there is no doubt that human beings are distinct from other animals, though not more distinct than other animals are from one another. Uh, maybe we've all been f- too focused on the differences for too long. Maybe we should emphasize what all of us animals have in common. Our resemblance to squirrels does not have to be inter- interpreted as a our self-image. Instead, it could be seen as a hopeful sign that we will someday be better at tree climbing. And um, that is the piece. Now, I have a, a question for you, all right? I was, you know, I'd say, fill in the answer in the comments below. Um, but I'm obviously being uh, facetious here because... Um, I'm going to ask you whether the author of this piece drives a snowplow or teaches philosophy at a college. (laughs) Uh, Did you have to think about that at all? The author teaches philosophy at Dickinson College in Pennsylvania. Um, And so just be aware that you too can spend a small fortune sending your child to college in Pennsylvania to be educated, no, indoctrinated by a man who is utterly convinced that not only are people and squirrels very similar, but that any tendency to view people as above and superior to animals um, is responsible for all the ills of the world. Um, He has, oh, I forgot, (laughs) I forgot to show you there was one other piece. Um, having to do with the environment, and uh, I'll see if I can find it. Um, Yeah, so um, he says, this distinction between people and animals means that we see an even bigger distinction between people and vegetation. And therefore, in this view, we don't owe nature anything. He's shocked at that prospect. We owe nature nothing. It is to yield us everything. This is the ideology of species annihilation and environmental destruction and also of technological development. Get it? Species annihilation, terrible. Environmental destruction, terrible. Technological development, terrible. And all this flows from the mistaken notion that people are different from animals. So, does it really matter? I mean, is there a reason why you should even be aware of such a foolish article uh, written by one of America's educational intellectuals? And the answer is yes, because a growing number of people buy into that worldview, to which you might say, but Rabbi Lappin, who cares? You know, people, some people believe that worldview, that we're the same as uh, squirrels, some don't. What's the difference? Why does it matter to me? And the answer is it matters to you because beliefs have consequences. And if large numbers of people in your society, wherever you live, believe a certain way, then you need to know that they will act in certain ways in accordance with their beliefs. What is more, a certain number of those people exercise some form of control over your life. Some number of those people actually have the ability to exercise power 
over you. And so again, understanding the kinds of things they're likely to do, because you understand the kind of things they believe, that can be very helpful. It can be helpful in building your bulwarks of defense and protecting uh, your people and fighting for your family and for your finances and for your friends. But that is all much better when you are forewarned and forearmed. And so we need to explore a little more deeply how that works. And as a happy warrior or an interested visitor, maybe you're not yet a happy warrior. Uh, I think you ought to become one because one of the advantages of becoming a happy warrior is that you get a copy of my free ebook download called The Holistic You. And uh, I'm not going to talk extensively about it now other than to say that it is an incredibly important tool in understanding not only your own fitness and health, but also understanding your finances and your family and your relationships. All of these things flow from the fact that we are a complex system of interconnected parts. And I lay this more out more in the holistic you, which you can get when you become a happy warrior. Um, uh, you can do it on the Rabbi Daniel Lappin.com website. And you can also do it on the WeHappyWarriors.com website. We Happy Warriors. So if you are a happy warrior, welcome to you. And if you're a happy warrior want to be, well, welcome to you. If you're just an interested tourist stopping by, well, welcome to you as well. And uh, I very much enjoy knowing that you are listening. And that is what uh, uh, fuels my enthusiasm in preparing these discussions with you and for you. And a number of people have asked why I don't do them in video form, and maybe I will start doing that, but the main reason I don't is because I very much like the idea of you being able to get uh, the content without having to devote 100% of your attention to it. I like the idea of you being able to uh, benefit from this content while you're driving or walking or exercising or running and jogging or uh, commuting or traveling, whatever you're doing, uh, I like the idea that all you have to do is pop a pair, a pair of earbuds in your ears and uh, you're able to listen while you're doing other stuff. Whereas with video, uh, it's far more time consuming. You by and large are giving much of your attention uh, to it, and that means you're not able to do anything else at the same time. But there are many other uh, sort of semi-automatic activities, uh, you know, like brushing your teeth, that you can actually do while listening to something, even something as important and as life-changing as the uh, information I'm going to be sharing with you now. Uh, also, in the uh, in the in the in the world of difference between people and squirrels, um, there there are several ones. I'll discuss a couple in the material I'm sharing with you. But right now, I'll talk about the fact that we make bread. No other animal goes through a lengthy process of making its food. We are unique in that we'll plant wheat, and we'll harvest the the wheat, and we'll thresh it, and then we'll grind it and then we'll mix it with water, and then we'll bake it. And this is a process that requires, number one, cooperation between many different people, uh, the farmer, the, the thresher, the harvester, etc., and the baker. Uh, but also, it requires the ability to defer gratification and to plan ahead. And these are uniquely spiritual qualities found only in human beings. One of the breads we use, and I've spoken about it from time to time, and a number of people have asked for more information, and that is the special bread we eat on the seventh day of the week, the Sabbath, uh, the Shabbat. It's called challah bread, and uh, Susan decided to set up a camera, and now we're b back to video because you can't do this just by audio, and um, she set up a camera, and she walks you through the whole process of baking challah bread, and um, and talks a lot about what goes on behind it and what the purpose is and what the idea is. 
and you actually watch her doing that. And so look out on the website on rabbidaniellappin.com. Please look out for the, uh, for the video of Susan baking challah bread, and uh, <laughs> you're going to enjoy it. She's very, she's very natural, having been raised in a British style as I was. She's a lot less uh, repressed <laughs> and just far more uh, comfortable just sort of being herself. And, uh, and I mean, I am with you because I regard you happy warriors as, as my, my, my closest group. But, um, but she's perfectly natural as she goes about uh, in the kitchen showing how challah bread is baked and explaining its significance and what it's all about. So uh, it's a video, and you can get hold of that on the website at rabbidaniellappin.com. And as for me, uh, repressiveness and all, you know that I am propelled by a passion to clarify that uh, the more that things change, the more we have to depend on those things that never change. And uh, as your rabbi, I like pulling out and laying out on the table in front of you the things that do not ever change. And I want to start off with something very basic indeed. And that is that we live in a world of dualities. Duality. Are you okay with that? We live in a world where twos matter very strongly. We're so used to it that we hardly give it any thought, right? We realize that a spectrum line runs between two ends, uh, good and evil, right? Light and darkness. It's something we take for granted. A spectrum line doesn't have three ends, any more than a piece of string has three ends. In fact, we could scarcely imagine a world in which a piece of string would have any more than two ends. That is the dual nature of the world in which we live. A battery has a positive and a negative pole. Um, that is reflected in an electrical outlet, which essentially has two connections. Yes, there's a third plug usually for ground but um, this two-ness is everywhere. And so, uh, so the number two has very special significance, not just because you've got light and darkness and good and evil and hot and cold, and for that matter, male and female. And, um, and I realize, obviously, that this flies in the face of a society that has surrendered to a spasm of superstition on this topic with an entire range of choices of gender. But that's not really how the world works. Not surprisingly, the entire digital revolution hinges on this duality, right? Our entertainment, communication, technology, all of this, which, by the way, the professor of philosophy at that college in Pennsylvania, he classifies the development of technology as alongside uh, destroying species and eviscerating the environment. Hey, technology. It's very interesting that that is part of the left. But again, that's uh, going a little further afield. <clears throat> um, the, um, the, the thing to realize digitally is that a switch is either on or off. Now, I'm not talking about a three or four position switch. You have some lamps where you can turn a switch to several positions for several levels of brightness. But basically, a switch is either on or off. Now, in the natural world, there is an analog reality, right? Um, we uh, Flowers, for instance, grow just a teensy little bit every, every day, a little bit more. But they don't grow in jumps, in digital steps. Uh, so we, we do realize there's such a thing as an analog as well. Our ears function on an analog basis. It's actually called a logarithmic scale because otherwise it would be, very, I mean, how do you have an ear that can listen to a gun going off nearby and also hear a whisper? It's an amazing range. And that's done because of the way we are created with a logarithmic response and our brains have the equivalent of millions of lines of software code to straighten all that out so as we can understand whether we're hearing something near, you know, an approaching car, or is there something far away and soft? 
All of that information comes because our ears are not uh, digital, they're analog. But our ears are analog in another way. They're not either receiving or not receiving. There's a range of volume, as I've explained. And um, <clears throat> and that, of course, is... Uh, is 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 uh, is different from how a digital system works. Digital system works on binary numbers, namely zero and one, only two numbers. It doesn't work on threes or fours or fives. It works with ones and zeros, only those two alternatives, those two states. And I'll tell you all of this because it's important to understand that this is something that flows organically from the very beginning of Genesis. And uh, by way of disclaimer, I want to make certain that you all understand that this show is not exclusively for people who take the Bible seriously and regard it as God's message to mankind. No, regardless of where you stand personally on the issue of faith, regardless of what your state of knowledge of the Bible is, of what your view and opinion of the Bible is, at the very least, regardless of where you come on or fall out on that particular idea, the one thing you probably agree with is the extraordinary influence that this majestic and mysterious volume has had on the story of civilization. So uh, this I, I say, and that is this is possibly the first generation in the last 2,000 years in which people who view themselves as educated, knowledgeable, and even sophisticated are utterly and sublimely clueless about the Bible. There are people who pontificate on television, who make pronouncements of great solemnity, who have no idea whether Leviticus is a book of the Bible or it is actually a man's aftershave lotion. This is something we should be aware of. It's hard to think of a book that has had anywhere close to the significant impact on civilization that the Bible has. And so when I speak about very early in the book of Genesis, what is the very first thing that God creates? As a matter of fact, it's light. It's a 25th Hebrew word of the text. And, and by the way, one of the ways that ancient Jewish wisdom shines a laser beam of clarity onto the Hebrew text is by counting words. The position of words is very significant, and uh, numbers play a very big role in that. Um, 25th word in the book of Genesis, 25th word, is light. That is the 25th Hebrew word of the text, and um, it's the English word light. And a lot of things flow from that, by the way. The Jewish festival of lights, which is Hanukkah. It's the only Jewish festival in the whole Hebrew calendar to fall on the 25th day of any month. It falls on what is known as the month of Kislev on the 25th day. Now, this has to do with the fact that the word light makes its appearance in the Bible as the 25th word. It's not an accident that Christmas, which is seen as a time in which light came into the world, also occurs on the 25th day of a month. And it's also no accident that people typically de decorate their homes or their Christmas trees with lights during that particular period. So light is the very first thing created. And again, this is not going to be a heavily technical discussion in any way. But I think part of what everybody should know is part of general knowledge, regardless of whether you're interested in any mathematics or physics or not, is that light is a very difficult thing to understand. Even today, with the advanced knowledge we have in physics, in thermodynamics, in energy, it's still extremely difficult to understand light. As a matter of fact, the problem revolves around the fact that light behaves as if it's two different things at the same time. Aha! This same duality we've been talking about. On the one hand, light behaves as if it is a stream of tiny tennis balls being fired out from the flashlight you hold in your hand as you go down to a dark cellar. Light bounces off mirrors in exactly the same way that a tennis ball bounces off a wall. And that seems to suggest that a light beam is a stream of tiny photons beaming out from the light source, and many experiments would confirm that. Then, if we put all that aside and run an entirely different set of experiments that have to do with what we call interference, we end up with an inescapable conclusion that no, light isn't tennis balls, it's waves. It's oscillating levels of uh, radio energy, 
It has to be. But on the other hand, it also has to be tennis balls. So which is it? The answer is both. That duality, that two-ness quality in light, makes its appearance right at the very beginning of the Bible. And I tell you all of this in order to lay the groundwork for perhaps one of the most basic existential questions of life. If you think about it for a moment, what is the sort of one basic question, whether you're a man or a woman, whether you are of any particular race or particular religion or particular nationality, regardless, it's something common to all human beings, a very basic question. The question is, how did we as human beings arrive on this isolated speck, this unique spot in a remote galaxy, far, far away, well, from anything and everything. How did that happen? You don't just hear that talking of duality and two-ness, there are only two possible answers to this question. And it's a very good question, because it's not as if we found any indication that there are any other creatures even remotely approaching our uniqueness anywhere else in the universe. And after, and that's after we've spent very, very large sums of money, unimaginably massive quantities of your tax money, on something called SETI, S-E-T-I, search for terrestrial extra, it says search for terrest, what is it? search, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. In other words, spending a lot of money to find out that maybe there are intelligent forms of life in the universe. Well. Not only have we not yet found the slightest hint of anything similar to us anywhere else in the universe, but as a matter of fact, we're not even actually able to certainly and unarguably identify any other places on which life could even exist. And so here we are. And so right now, uh, people will tell you, well, we've mathematically and statistically, we are certain that there's life elsewhere in the universe. Yeah, right. So here's the problem. The problem is that when anything unique happens, it's suspect. All right. In other words, uh, if things are truly accidental, if things are truly random, they never, ever happen only once. And so um, if uh, if somebody um, trips on a staircase, it might have been a random incident. But... um, if uh, it only happens in that one place on the staircase, then it's probably not a coincidence because several people do it. And, um, and then in that case, you may want to look and see if there's a, a loose piece of carpet or whether that the riser at that point of the staircase is an extra inch high over all the others, which throws the rhythm with which you go up the staircase off. Uh, but the bottom line is, that uh, mathematicians get this. If, if you set up a random number generator, and there are plenty of ways of doing that, you can be sure it'll throw out the same number if you watch it long enough. It has to, all right? It, it absolutely has to. Nothing that happens randomly only happens once. And if you think about it, it's sort of an obvious axiom. But uh, it's something that much of mathematics and physics is based on, much of our understanding of the atom and collisions between atoms, all of that based on our understanding of what randomness means. And random cannot just happen once. Do you follow what I'm saying? Do you follow the terrifying implications of what I'm saying? What am I saying? The reason it's so important is because if we are on this earth, we humans are a unique phenomenon. If we're just, there's nothing like us anywhere in the universe, that is a huge problem. Because that means that we're not random, we're not a coincidence. Because nothing accidental ever happens only once. If it ever happens more than once, it wasn't an accident. In other words, if a person trips on the same place on the stairs several times, then it's not an accident. There's something going on there. But if something happened only once, it could be a random event. Well, you see, if we're exploring the question of how we humans arrived on planet Earth, how did we get to this tiny, little, insignificant, and obscure planet in a tiny, 
and insignificantly obscure solar system, in itself a tiny and obscure part of a galaxy in a remote corner of the universe, here we are. What's more, in spite of the fact that large sums of money, incalculably large sums of tax money have been spent on trying to find other forms of intelligent life in the universe, and it hasn't happened yet. And by the way, if it should happen, it wouldn't worry me in the slightest. Right? Not because I'm a person of scientific training, and not as a God-fearing, Bible-believing religious person. Neither way would it bother me, and I'll tell you why. We were talking about a very important principle that has many applications in mathematics. This principle that no truly random event happens only once. All right? <clears throat> well, when something happens only one time, then it becomes a different kind of problem. You have to say to yourself, if it only happened once, then it's not an accident. It was not random. If something happened only once, there must be something going on. When things happen randomly, then you get a distribution of events. And so if a trip on the staircase is random, then it would be on all the steps, not on any one particular step. But if people trip only at one particular step, that's not random. I suggest you measure the step. There's, there's something going on there because we get used to a rhythm running up and down steps. This violates the rhythm and somebody trips. There's a reason for it. But when things happen only once, you got to know there's a reason. If we find other intelligent life in the universe, it's perfectly possible from a mathematical point of view to say that the development of life on this planet was random, accidental, evolutionarily unpredictable, just one of those things that happens, and it has to have happened on several planets. The proof is that it happened on this planet called Earth, and if it also happened on another planet, you know, 27 years away, and it happened somewhere else 300 light years away, and you see, life evolves, life happens. But, my friends, if it is not found anywhere else in the universe, and after considerable searching so far it hasn't, then this becomes a huge problem. For who? Well, for all the people who are indoctrinated and conditioned to believe that we humans are here on this planet by a random coincidental sequence of events. And this brings us back to the duality I was talking about, how we live in a world where two-ness is a significant reality, where things seem to happen in twos, and that two is a very important number. You won't be shocked to hear that there are two answers, only two possible ways to answer the question of how we got to this planet. Not 11, not 7, not 1. Two ways to answer that question. What are the two ways? Well, very simple. How did we arrive on this planet? Why are there human beings on this planet? Answer number one. By a lengthy process of unaided, random, materialistic evolution, primitive protoplasm turned into Bach and Beethoven. That's all. Primitive protoplasm turned into plumbers and proctologists. Primitive protoplasm randomly and accidentally turned into ballerinas and bookkeepers. That's one explanation for how we're here. The explanation for how we're here is that the good Lord created us in his image and put us here. Those are the two answers. The truth is, there's absolutely no scientific method to prove either of these propositions. You see, that is very important. I want to repeat it. There is no scientific way to prove either one of these propositions is the correct one. We're, we're stuck with two. And as I'm going to show you, it's going to end up being a decision of belief, not a decision of fact. You might say, well, I've heard scientific evolution is a proven fact. It's unargued. It's established. My answer to you is, look, you don't need to be a biologist you don't have to be an astrophysicist. You don't have to be a historian. All you have to do is be an intelligent observer to say to yourself that things that are proven do not continue exciting controversy. Let me put it this way. There's not a lot of controversy in the culture about whether the planet Earth is round or whether it's flat. Right? There might have been people once upon a time who thought that the Earth was flat, it's pretty clearly established now that the Earth is round. I think we can safely say it's a scientific reality that the Earth is round. 
And what's more, there is no cultural argument about it. There's no debates about who's teaching what in schools. There's no people yelling about it in debates and arguments. There are no faculty members being fired from universities because they believe the earth is flat. No, it's settled. But if the origin of human life on this earth was settled science, then no scientist would be losing their jobs at universities because they question it. People who occupy exalted positions in Washington, D.C. at the Smithsonian would not be losing their jobs, as one has. Why? Because of their beliefs, because of their views. The conflict rages. It's far from settled. That's why I said it's not possible to prove that we are here on this planet because the good Lord created us in his image and put us here. It's also not possible to prove that we are here because of a lengthy process of unaided materialistic evolution that enabled primitive protoplasm to become baboons and do and baboons to become bishops. And obviously, if there was a way to prove it either way, then faith would vanish. If it was able to prove that we are here because of a materialistic process, then faith would be gone. If it was possible to prove that we are here because of a loving God who created us in his image, then that would take away faith too, wouldn't it? And so all the benefits that accrue to us, those people who do have faith, those benefits that accrue to us are benefits that would vanish if in fact it was possible to prove one way or the other. So faith is retained in a very positive and useful kind of a way. And no, science has not proven in any way whatsoever how human beings actually did arrive on this planet. So the basic question still only gets answered in one of two ways. How did human beings arrive on the planet? I've told you the two possible ways are either the uh, uh, either the good Lord created us in his image and put us here, or alternatively, we are here because of a lengthy process of unaided materialistic evolution. And, um, you know, does it matter how you answer this? Very much so. Because the way this question gets answered is going to force us into answering another question. The other question is, are we nothing but about $9 worth of common chemicals cunningly strung together? Are we just a bunch of molecules? Are we just hydrogen and oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, potassium, sodium? When you put all these things together in the right proportions and the right arrangements, you get a human being. Is that what we are? Or are we, in fact, unique creatures touched by the finger of God? I think it's pretty clear that how you answered that first question will dictate how you answered the second question. If you say we're here because the good Lord created us and put us here, then you would say, no, we're not just a bunch of chemicals put together. We are a unique creature touched by the finger of God. But if, on the other hand, you say, no, I think I'm going to live my life as if we are here because of a random sequence of coincidences, a lengthy process of unaided materialistic evolution, well, then the result is you're probably going to say that we're a bunch of chemicals, just like everything else is in the universe. There's stones, there's liquids, there's... Uh, solids, there's vegetable material, there's animal material, but uh, all that we are is just a different arrangement of those basic components. What's the difference? Don't you wonder what the practical life results are of how you choose to answer that question? See, the problem is that you kind of do have to answer it. You have to deal with it, because like I said, when a large number of people in your society start believing one way or the other about one of these important existential questions, then they're going to start acting in certain ways that flow naturally from that belief system. And many of those people have influence over your life. So you better know what's going on. Cannot put aside this basic question of how we got here. Cannot be ignored. Any sentient, thoughtful person realizes that there are real consequences to how you answer the question. So, um, <clears throat> you know, in, 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 in our post-industrial era, we're so used to solving questions scientifically. We're so used to saying, I don't know what the answer to this is, but I'll look it up on the Internet and I'll tell you. But what about questions that don't lend themselves to that sort of answer? There are questions to which science is simply simply not the right instrument, right? Um, if you want to use your cell phone to find out if there's radioactivity 
in your house. Wrong instrument. You need a Geiger counter. Um, if you want to measure your blood pressure, you cannot use a voltmeter. There are different instruments for different things. And, um, you know, my, my crescent wrench is a great instrument. I love it. It's a very nice tool, but it's not much good for fixing a window. It's just not used for that. So uh, you you got to realize that science is just another tool and, um, and that uh, there are many questions in the world that science is just the wrong tool to use. And so on a question of how we arrived on this planet, um, you can try and use science and you come up with a theory which is a materialistic, unaided theory of evolution, and, or you can take a spiritual view. But either way, this is a very interesting question, how we got here. And it's interesting because it has a duality. There are only two possible answers. And there's no way of proving which one is which. And we cannot turn either of these two belief answers into a fact answer. They're beliefs. And, um, and you know, you've you got to understand, there are, are plenty of things in life that we don't have a way of proving. When most people get married, you know, you don't know for a fact that you'll live happily ever after. Nobody can know that. But you do believe it. If you didn't believe it, you wouldn't do it. How about when you make a major investment? Do you really know that it's going to work out fantastically? Of course not. If you did, there'd be zero risk. If there's no risk, there's no possible reward. Anytime in our lives, there are so many important decisions. There are so many major actions we have to take where we simply don't have all the facts. We may have some of the facts, and so we make an educated decision, but very often we're going on our beliefs. What happens to the young man who says, you know, I will not get married until I'm absolutely 100% sure, until I've got all the facts. The result I can promise you is that he will remain a lonely single male. You cannot wait. Because life has a way of requiring us to make decisions and forcing us to make commitments. And so we have no option but to go ahead and act on our beliefs, very often not on the facts. You can't help it. We have no choice. And uh, my friends, understanding the duality of this question is helpful because it impacts the real life decisions that we make. The kind of marriage we have, the kind of home we create, our relationships with our children and our siblings and our parents, our relationships to money, uh, and all of these things flow from how we answer this basic question. That's why it is that we have to realize the, the significance of this question. And we have to realize that we have to make a decision on this question before all the facts are in. In other words, we have to decide this entire question on a belief basis because life won't allow us the luxury of postponing the question, shelving the question, tabling the question until such time as it might become clear. Right now, we've got to choose how to live our life. I look around and I say, here are people who live their life believing we are descended from baboons, and here are people choosing to believe that we are touched by the finger of God. These are two different ways of living, two different ways of building families, two different ways of relating to business and money and finance, and I'm going to choose the one, and I'm going to believe according to that way. That's how it works. And so we're going to now, I think, try and take a little bit of a look into just how these answers do impact our finances, our friendships, our families, our fitness. And uh, then it'll follow what we can do about them. Um, I must explain to you that the way that science works is that we try to find an explanation for things that we notice going on. And that explanation works a while until we find something that it doesn't explain where it falls down. It's always very painful for the scientist involved. For instance, there was a British scientist called Rutherford who was trying to understand in the late 19th century how the atom works. What is the basic structure of the most elemental particle in the universe? And back then they thought it was an atom. 
and he came up with the idea of what the inside of the atom looks like. And everyone was very excited, and he was honored. He was the great scientist of the day. He was blazing new paths through a new science of atomic physics. Well, you know what came on? The next thing that came was the change of the century from the 19th to the 20th. And then there was a Polish mathematician called Hermann Minkowski. And after that, there was a Swiss, math Swiss mathematician called Albert Einstein. And pretty soon, the Rutherford model of the atom was no longer applicable. It did not answer everything. It didn't explain everything. It actually explained nothing. And so the Rutherford model was consigned to obscurity. That is how science works back in the early 1700s. It was a wonderful time because so much was beginning to be uncovered. There was a man called Antony Leuvenhoek who lived in Holland, and he was a devout, religious, Bible-believing Christian, and he was the man who started building microscopes. Nothing like that had ever existed. He had to grind his own lenses out of glass, and he made better and better ones, and he started peering into water. You know, they used to put barrels out to the bottom of downspouts so the water that came down off the roof would come down the gutter and then fill up the barrel and would fill up with rainwater. I've, I've seen these things in England. And he took some of that water and to his astonishment, through his primitive microscope, he saw thousands of teensy-weensy little organisms in the water cavorting around and swimming around and moving in the water. He literally electrified the Royal Society of Scientists back in London when he started telling them about these tiny little creatures that he's discovered living in the water. He died in 1729. And then right after that, um, a young Italian man called Lazzaro Spallanzani. And Spallanzani, also a Christian, decided to go further on this. He was trying to struggle to find out where these things came from. We're talking about the mid-1700s, so it's within, you know, relatively modern history. Human beings believed in the spontaneous generation of life, that just out of water would come these little creatures out of nothing. That's what Leuvenhoek believed when he saw them in his microscope, and Sp uh, Spallanzani um, decided to challenge this. So he took clean, distilled water, sealed it into a glass flask from which all the air was removed, and he waited, and he waited, and he waited. And when he finally examined it later, there were no little creatures. And he therefore refuted the theory that in water, little things just came to life automatically. He later showed that when he did not seal the water off from the air, he allowed air to get at it, get at it. tiny airborne microbes began to grow in the water, we think of them as germs or whatever you want to call them, but we realize now that, like everything else, microbes do have parents. But that's not something that was well known at the time. People had their theories. And along came Lazzaro Spallanzani, and he said, let's check it out. And sure enough, he turned out to be right. He upset the theories of everybody else around. One of the things that distinguished Spallanzani as a scientist is that he's meticulous about his honesty. He even devised experiments to challenge his own theories. He wanted to make sure that he arrived at the truth, and that was wonderful, because what is very often the case, and there's a lot of bogus science, there's a lot of scamming going on today in science, because there's so much money in it and so politicized. There's a lot of government grants, there's university positions, there's prestige, there's prominence. So people come up with theories and then cling to them. But Spallanzani was an exception. Second half of the 18th century, Spallanzani turned the scientific world on its head as he explained that everything had an origin. The origin of human beings at the time they used to believe was in, they, they believed in the homunculus. Um, the homunculus was an inside our human reproductive organs were, you know, huge numbers of tiny, tiny little human beings. And um, you can actually see in 18th century paintings they had paintings of what they believed these little homunculi looked like. Tiny, tiny little human beings contained inside human beings because they simply had no idea of how a sperm and an egg fertilized and joined together to become something entirely new. They had no knowledge of that. It was simply not understood. Not that it's fully understood today either. But, And so this idea of testing a theory is something that is very worthwhile doing. It doesn't happen quite as often in science as it used to because science has become so politicized. 
But uh, let me give you some examples, maybe two examples of how we might test the theory that human beings are nothing but the result of a lengthy process of unaided materialistic evolution where primitive organisms turned into more sophisticated organisms, turned into uh, uh, turtles, and turtles turned into baboons, and baboons turned into Neanderthals, and Neanderthals turned into Albert Einstein, and so on and so forth. That's how it goes. Well, how might you test that? You see, what you've got to realize, please, and just bear with me on this, is that for those of you who believe that that's how human beings arrived on this planet, it follows as naturally as night follows day that we are nothing but animals. We are in quality just the same as animals. We have less hair than some animals. We can run faster than tortoises, but not as fast as cheetahs. Our eyes, but it's not as good as owls. Uh, And so we hear better than some animals, but not as well as others. We're just another animal on the spectrum of animals. Um, So clearly it follows that universities would take that position. And the Peabody Museum at Yale ran an exhibit a few years back where they classified human beings as just another creature. And they showed a lineup. And to this very day, you can go to museums where they will show you the famous silhouette pictures of baboons. It's like seven or eight figures. The first one, very clearly a baboon. The second one is a baboon sort of trying to stand up. And the last one is very clearly a human being. Aggression, little by little, the baboon goes upright. He stands up legs. Then he becomes more and more human looking. He becomes Homo erectus. He's now an erect standing creature. And then he becomes a human being. Look, this is very much a doctrine of belief within the school of thought that believes that we're here because of a lengthy process of unaided materialistic evolution. And more and more people in the culture are believing that belief, adopting that faith, if you like. It's in the universities, it's in entertainment, it's in politics. And you have to see there is a link between that and the move towards socialism. And so if you care about your money, and we all care about our money, then you need to care people around you are believing because those beliefs have practical political consequences and guess who'll be paying the price for those consequences that's right you and me that's exactly right and so um you got that many smart people believe that we're here because of random materialistic unaided evolution and that means we're nothing but animals And that means we're nothing but a few dollars worth of basic chemicals. And, um, you know, you think what is interesting is that uh, we are um, a whole lot of water, like 70% of of us is water. And in talking of that, let me uh, let me take just a very brief detour uh, when I ask you to question coincidence, always question coincidence. You know, I've told you before, there is no word in the Lord's language for coincidence. It doesn't exist. Isn't it a strange coincidence, if you'll pardon me, that we human beings are the same proportion of water as the oceans are of the surface of the earth? About 70% of the surface of the earth is covered with the ocean. And about 70% of the weight of a human being is water. What a strange coincidence. Here's another one. Ocean water is salt water. What is the water inside us? Just taste your tears the next time you're not sure. It's also salt water. That's interesting. Could it be an accident that in the Lord's language, in Hebrew, the same word is used for the days of your lives as for the oceans of the world? That word, by the way, yamim. Uh, The yamim means the days of your life, and it also means all the oceans of the world. Right? But we still got to ask ourselves, are we nothing but hydrogen and oxygen and carbon and nitrogen, potassium and sodium and chlorine? Is that what we are? Are we really something just completely basic, just physical, no different from a cow or a cat or a kangaroo? Or are we something unique, creatures touched by the finger of God? Now, I'll point out, as I mentioned, that the Bible played such a huge role in the development of Western civilization. Obviously, the first couple of chapters of the Bible are all about this idea that we are a completely different species. Oh, we have similarities with animals, obviously, as the professor of philosophy at a Pennsylvania university so eloquently put it, we poop. Yes, we have animalistic qualities, but 
Is that all there is to us? <laughs> Not by any means. We are unique creatures touched by the finger of God. That became a part of Western thinking. And that's why the Western world produced the greatest freedom and the greatest uh, health and the greatest wealth of any society in the history of the world. And it's no coincidence that now as that belief is fading away, socialism is returning. And along with that will come a declining quality of life and significant declining of material wealth. You do need to know about this stuff. You really do. And that's why I humbly nominate myself as your rabbi. Oh, my goodness. Our answers, as we've already covered, are basically materialistic, a materialistic answer and a spiritual answer. An answer that is secular and an answer that is religious. An answer that is spiritual and an answer that is physical. That's the choice we all have to make. Do we want the one answer or do we want the other answer? Do we decide that we are living only in a materialistic world in which only materialistic explanations can make sense? Or do we live in a spiritual world as well? Are we human beings, us humans, are we only body or are we also soul? And we really have to ask ourselves that because if we are only body then every single problem that we can possibly have would be solved pharmacologically, right? There would be a pill to be popped for everything. And sure enough, today, a large number of children at schools, particularly boys, are drugged by the school. The school makes them take drugs because whatever is wrong can surely be fixed with a combination of chemicals. That's the belief system. And please, please, if your son is being given Ritalin at school, really ask yourself if, if that reflects your belief system. And maybe you want to tell the school that if the teacher has trouble with your son, let the teacher take drugs, but not to force your child to. Now, I said before that this approach, this materialistic approach, says that we humans... That we're nothing but the result of a random process of lengthy, unaided materialistic evolution, then of course we're nothing but an arrangement of chemicals. And if that's the case, no matter what goes wrong, all we do is rearrange the chemicals until they're back the way they're meant to be. And we do that with more chemicals called pills and tablets, medications, drugs, inoculations, and vaccinations. Well, if that is indeed what we're all about, then yes, of course, no matter what ails us, we need to resolve it with medication. But if, on the other hand, we are not just body, but we're all soul, then there are certain problems that we all go through which have their origins in the spirit, not the body. This basic conflict is what drove apart two friends and colleagues in the early 20th century, Sigmund Freud, the father of modern psychotherapy, and Carl Jung. Carl Jung was not Jewish, he was Christian, he had some religious sensitivity, and he claimed that the human being was body and soul. He was the one, by the way, who encouraged Wilson to come up with the Alcoholics Anonymous organization. And you know that the 12-step program of Alcoholics Anonymous starts off with a belief in a greater force. And all this came about because Carl Jung recognized that we are body and soul. And if, they're, if we're body and soul, then certain things that go wrong with our body could have the basic problem embedded not in the body but in the soul and so the solution may not be chemical drugs tablets and medications but the solution may be something spiritual he recognized that alcoholism was not a physical disorder as much as it was a spiritual disorder when people overdrank alcohol and although addiction becomes a very powerful difficult to resist physical drive the basic cause is the search for some spiritual satisfaction. He says that's why the old monks of medieval times used to call alcohol spiritus. And we still, still call them spirits, right? Uh, because spiritus in Latin um, means spiritual. Spirits, a recognition that alcohol was useful in making spiritual pain go away. Not physical, spiritual. It's not even good for you physically. But it's so very helpful spiritually. People fall for it. It's very understandable. 
And so Carl Jung, the great psychiatrist, encouraged the founding of Alcoholics Anonymous. And the reason it's, it's one of history's most successful treatment program for alcoholism is precisely because of its spiritual component. Um, meanwhile, his friend and colleague, Sigmund Freud, was a secularized Jew, and he decided that we're only here because of evolution, therefore we are nothing but an arrangement of chemicals, therefore there's nothing wrong with us that can resolve chemically. Although the pharmaceutical industry had not evolved yet in Sigmund Freud's days, his work was mostly in the first half of the 20th century, mostly before World War II. The pharmaceutical industry, where there's literally a pill claim to solve everything, and as a result, Sigmund Freud um, well, he became the dirty old man of psychiatry. Everything he saw had a basic materialistic solution, a predominantly sexual, and he saw that in almost everything. Um, Freud was an interesting guy, there's no question about it, but the struggle between Freud and you is once again this dualism. The struggle between a view of man as purely physical and the view of man as spiritual as well as physical. And uh, not surprisingly, uh, men who have very different outlooks obviously <clears throat> hardly have remained friends. And, uh, and of course, they did have a breakup. And um, so, um, <clears throat> which, you know, which, which is it? And as I said, life doesn't give us the luxury of lots of time to make that decision. You have to fairly early, and if you do this before you get married, uh, you're way ahead of the game. But most of us don't manage to do that. But you, you have to, as quickly as possible, make up your mind whether you are going to live life as if we are body and soul, physical and spiritual, or whether you're going to live life as if we are nothing but 10 bucks worth of chemicals. You've got to make a decision. There isn't really a choice. So just know that very real-life consequences flow from whether you regard a human being as a unique, special, spiritual creature touched by God, or whether you regard the human being as just a random accident of a mindless cosmos. There really are consequences. Now, you know, it's not as if you can't draw on any intelligence at all. You've just got to make an irrational belief judgment. No, there are ways you, 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 you tend to stretch your thinking on this. <clears throat> and you may not end up with a conclusive result because that's not even really how science works. But you may end up with clues and guides. For instance, one of the most amazing things about human beings is altruism. Now, I'm not talking about when a parent gives up life in order to save a child. Right? That can be answered by the behavior of biology. That can be answered by saying we're sophisticated animals, and like all animals, we want to focus on the survival of our genes, and etc., etc. You all know how that works. But when I speak about altruism, I'm speaking about a stranger who sacrifices for someone else. That's a different story. People give up kidneys uh, for, for strangers. Uh, soldiers give up their lives or risk their lives in order to save their comrades. That's altruism, which is very hard to, de to explain biologically. How does it help evolution? And this is a problem, because while all kinds of ingenious theories are advanced, those who do believe that we're here because of an accident of statistical random evolution that not only happened in this corner of the universe, but happened in thousands of other stars and planets around the universe, well, they're a bit baffled by altruism. They try very hard to come up with an explanation, but it's a tough one to answer because although to save my own flesh and blood makes sense, why would I save someone with whom I only share a religion or a nationality? Are spiritual constructs. After all, no animal thinks of itself as being part of a nationality. There are no animals that say, well, I'm sorry, I can't come down now. I'm a Canadian. I don't go to the United States. Animals don't think that way. Nationality is a human spiritual construct. And so when we say, when we sacrifice ourselves to save someone of our nation, that's a spiritual activity. It's not an accident, by the way, that socialism spreading like wildfire through the hearts of men throughout the world today in whatever country you live, it's not an accident that socialism, which believes in an utterly materialistic world, not um, it's not an accident that socialism believes in the abolition of nationalities. In fact, the song that communists sing is called the Internationale. 
out of my kindness and consideration to you, my happy warrior, I will refrain from singing it for you. But that's what it is, the International. Before John Lennon had his conversion process where he rethought everything later in life, he sang that silly song, Imagine. And that was again a socialist dream. Everyone part of no religion, no nationality, all one big happy human family. Doesn't ever quite work out like that, does it? The the biggest gulags, the biggest massacres of human beings in the 20th century were performed by socialism. National socialism of Hitler, Russian socialism of Stalin, Chinese socialism of Mao. But nobody in in a history of humanity has been as comfortable with killing as many human beings as socialists are. Well, if we're all just animals, why should that matter? The idea of us caring about people with whom we have any spiritual connection, not blood connection, is very powerful, right? In other words, tribal societies make sense on a materialistic level, right? Tribal societies would make sense because it's all blood. And in cases like some of the Arabian ruling dynasties, the aristocracy, the ruling people are all related by blood, which is not true in spiritual democracies like England and United States and Australia and Canada, uh, where the ruling people are not related to one another, with occasional exceptions, where there is a spiritual reality. We acknowledge that connection. I will sacrifice for a fellow American. I will sacrifice for a fellow, fellow believer in God. So altruism uh, works, yes, but it works in a spiritual construct. It works because of shared religion or because of shared nationality. I agree that altruism exists within families or tribes. That makes sense biologically. I have no question on that. But that it should exist among fellow soldiers or among fellow co-religionists, now that is something very different. No animal does that. And, uh, and there, are, there are other uh, awkward facts that make it uh, difficult to dive wholeheartedly into the materialistic view of humanity and reality. Uh, money is one of them. Because money is so uniquely human. The ability to uh, create an abstract representation of value, um, and value in itself is a subjective thing, right? In other words, what one person will pay for a certain commodity or service is quite different from what another person will pay for it. We have different values, and the whole reason that trade exists among human beings is because I value my old toaster at less than what you'll pay me for it, and that money is worth more to me. And I understand that this money is a representation of a value, but these these are are are, are uniquely human things which are problematic if uh, you are on the other side. Um, here's another one that is problematic: uh, placebos. What is a placebo? It's a scary word. Um, it's scary for people who believe in a materialistic view of reality because um, in uh, a place, no less a place than Harvard, the highest pinnacle of American academia, Harvard, they got a clinic focused entirely on placebo. It's amazing. When you think about it, it's remarkable. It's called the Program in Placebo Studies and uh, the Therapeutic Encounter. This is a Harvard-affiliated program at a Harvard-affiliated hospital. It's amazing. It began, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, somewhere thereabouts. And what happened was that it flowed from a particular clinical drug trial, which had 270 subjects. All these 270 patients had severe pain in their arms and elbows and shoulders and wrists. And in, um, in the, the study, they gave half the subjects got pain-reducing pills, and the other half were offered acupuncture treatments. And they were all warned that both these things had side effects. They both alleviated the pain, but they came with various side effects. Well, would you believe that half the people 
135 of them were given acupuncture and half were given tablets and they all began calling in saying the side effects were killing them the side effects were terrible they were making them sluggish and causing pain so all the side effects they were warned about they all reported getting even the ones having acupuncture were told that the acupuncture will make your pain go away but it'll cause redness on your skin and swelling here's something really remarkable they all complained about the side effect they also reported real relief from the carpal tunnel and the shoulder pain and everything so they really reported very good results from the pain from the solving the pain but they all reported the side effects um harvard was astounded by this and uh, and this i think is why they started up the study center because these findings were amazing you want to know why because the pills the tablets that half the patients had been given were actually made out of cornstarch and sugar there was no medication it was a placebo there was nothing there and guess what the acupuncture needles were bogus needles they were retractable no skin ever got punctured no skin was ever pierced by a needle and so the patients do you know what I mean? I'm sure you've seen the, the kids used to have these play knives where the hand, you know, you, the the knife blade is made of rubber, but when you pressed it down, it retracted into the handle. Um, so the needles looked like they were going into the skin, but they weren't. They were just retracting into the handles. And uh, the these patients, uh, where nothing was done to them, no no acupuncture, no medicine. But they were told by people who looked very impressive with a lot of degrees and with white coats and stethoscopes. They were told, listen, you've got to be ready for the side effects. Although it's very effective for your pain, they're going to be side effects. And sure enough, they report great pain relief, but terrible side effects, including swelling of the skin and redness of the skin. So in other words, it's the brain, it's, the, it's, it's something inside of them that links to the body, right? because they're told through the ears what's going to happen and sure enough the body makes it happen uh, this is because we are holistic beings and again i want to stress that if you haven't yet got hold of my free ebook the download called the holistic you please make sure you get it because it's the beginning of the understanding of the totality of the human being how complicated is this mechanism and um, and you 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 know you've got to understand that if you tamper in one part, don't think the other part isn't impacted, and the mind or the soul is part of that. We really have to understand it. So this is why that for those people who view the world as entirely material, the placebo concept is very hard because the placebo proves the existence of maybe a soul, something else. Placebo teaches us about holistic medicine, that very often we suffer from what a long time ago, mid-20th century, wasn't understood, and that was psychosomatic disorders, where there is a physical manifestation, a physical symptom, a physical syndrome that is caused purely by a spiritual circumstance. And uh, it's worth understanding. I mean, after World War II, uh, there were many people who had um, severe conditions with no underlying neurological condition and these things came about strictly because of traumatic experiences in world war ii and that was when they began to understand psychosomatic disorder so placebos and psychosomatic disorders these kinds of ideas are they, they cause tremendous consternation to those who see the world in purely materialistic terms because if we are purely materialistic then the only way to fix and cure us is with material things, namely tablets and pills and, and syringes and injections and medications and drugs. But the very fact that there is such a thing as a placebo, which has no physical effect, it's only spiritual, and it depends on your belief in the doctor who gave it to you and your belief in how well he explains it to you and what it's going to do to you and for you. It's all untrue. It doesn't matter. Powerful belief in something untrue is more effective than a lack of belief in something that is true. We human beings are incredibly impacted by belief, incredibly impactful. 
something very, very powerful. It's something we've got to understand. As we continue understanding this and growing in this, you're going to be able to see more and more instances of how this applies. And more importantly, you're going to see more and more instances of how you can apply it in your own life. And that's where it gets to be truly very interesting indeed. I said that we were going to take a look at some of the ways in which how you answer this question of namely, how did we get on this planet, is going to impact your attitudes about taxes, about inheritance, about sex, about many, many things that are at the heart of what is the essence of life. Everything impacted. And more importantly, not only is it you, but all the people that live around you, and as I said, many of whom have some control of your life, if only by the environment in which you live. And so what they believe is very important. And it's very important for you to know what the people around you believe. In the United States at the moment, there is a growth of the religion of socialism, perhaps more rapidly than at any other time in the history of this country. And uh, the belief in socialism is a belief, right, Again, as I've explained to you, there's a duality, right? You can look at the world with God or without God. Socialism is without, with God is with. And uh, the, uh, the practical results, the real-life impact, uh, impact of those beliefs are things you really have to understand and things you really have to know. So, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, if somebody tells me, how he would answer the question of how human beings arrived on this planet, I will tell you what his opinion is about inheritance tax. I'll tell you what he believes about sex education in public school, even before he tells us himself. We human beings are hardwired to seek spiritual coherence. We are hardwired to find consistent meaning in our lives. We are hardwired to develop a worldview a Weltanschauung, a worldview in which things make sense. And much of it flows from how we decide to answer that question. See, there's no option of waiting because so many decisions in life have to be made before we're going to have any definitive answers. Belief, not facts. That's what governs everything. And so what are some of the political and cultural real-life implications of how you answer the fundamental existential question of how did human beings get to be on planet Earth? Are we here because God created us in his image and put us here? That's one possibility. And the only other possibility, you know it already, right? We're here through a process of unaided materialistic evolution. And I just again clarify, there really is a dichotomy here, right? There's a duality, like I mentioned at the beginning of today's show. Uh, it's one or the other. And the two answers are not only opposite of one another, they're incompatible. Now, some people have sometimes said to me, well, Rabbi Lappin, maybe God decided to use evolution. And the answer is, yes, of course. God could have used evolution, or he could have used a lawnmower, or he could have used a food processor, or he could have used a professor of philosophy, he could have used anything, could have used whatever he wanted. That's not the point. That's not one of the options. The question is not, what did God use? The question is, was God involved at all? And that's why there are only two answers, yes or no. Either God was involved and he created us in his image, using whatever he wanted to use. Uh, it doesn't matter for now, but he did create us. Or alternatively, the other view, which is unaided, unaided, that means no God, unaided materialistic evolution, random unaided random materialistic evolution, coincidence, a cosmos, uh, a cosmological accident. No God, no intelligent force, no nothing, just random coincidence. Collision of atoms and molecules that began to form the organic building blocks of life. You've got to choose. It's one or the other. And how you will live your life from here on outwards is very much a function of the decision you make on that choice. It's box number one or box number two. Which one do you want? Well, what are the consequences? One is very interesting. Remember that if you're going to say that we are not creatures touched by the finger of God, 
God had nothing to do with this, and that this is a totally materialistic, random process. Why the conclusion then is that you and I are nothing but sophisticated, smart, intelligent animals. We don't swim as well as whales, but we swim better than rats. We don't run as fast as cheetahs, but we're not as big as strong as elephants. Our brains are bigger than many other creatures, but there are other creatures, like whales, for instance, and elephants, whose brains weigh more than ours. But it doesn't matter. The point is that it's not just a case of degree. We're just different from them in a little bit more hair or a little less hair, bigger head, smaller head. We're all basically just animals. And if that's the case, then it does make sense that we need to be taken care of either by a farmer or by a zookeeper, right? Because you've conceded that if it's not with God, then we are animals. You know, different from other animals, but just in the way, you know, elephants cannot be compared to whales, people can't be compared to kangaroos, but we're all basically the same, then we do need to be taken care of, either a farmer or a zookeeper. Think about that for a moment. We need a farmer or a zookeeper. Now, people who look at life this way think that they know the very perfect zookeeper and farmer to take care of them. It's called government. And for questions that are too big for one government, well, then it's an organization of government. Let's call it the United Nations. And that's one of the reasons that people generally who tell me that they believe that we are here through a process of random, materialistic, unaided evolution, then I say to them, um, you're very optimistic about the United Nations, aren't you, about it keeping the peace and moving the world forward to a more glorious time of brotherhood and goodness? And they always invariably say, yes, of course. And so um, let's go with a, a silly thought experiment, would you? Imagine a cow coming to the farmer one evening and saying to the farmer, Farmer Jones, moo, before we quit for the day, I need to speak to you on behalf of all the other cows. I've been assigned the spokesman, and I've come here to tell you that we all feel you're taking way too much of our milk. We'd like to set a cap above which you will not take the milk. Now, this is negotiable. Maybe you get 50% of the milk that we produce. We'll keep 50%. Maybe you'll get 60. We keep 40. But let's talk about it. Bottom line is you can't have all the milk. At this point, Farmer Jones puts down his pail pushes his hat back on his head, looks at the cow and says, Look here, cow. I want you to understand something. You're only here because I arranged for the veterinarian to come along and impregnate your mother with sperm I bought from a farmer who happens to have a few bulls. And that's why you're here. And I was here to birth you the night you were born. And whenever you're sick, I'm the one who gives you medicine. And I feed you every day. See that tractor? I drive it over here with your feed every day. And when you're dead, I'll haul your carcass away and burn it. But until then, you're mine. I own you. You will give me all the milk you produce. Think about it. And you'll see that this is the deal that socialism makes with its citizens. We will educate your children. We'll give you medicine when you're sick. We'll give you money to live on when you're too old to work. And we might even bury you at the end of the day. But until then, we own you. Until then, you give us everything. Now, we might be really nice, and we might end up just charging you 70% income tax or 50% income tax. But no socialist politician would ever give you an answer to the question of what is the absolute maximum percentage of tax that any citizen should ever have to pay. No socialist politician will answer that. Because in the final analysis, they don't want to rule out the possibility of a 100% tax, because that's the ultimate deal. And that, my friends, is a very good definition of slavery, right? We'll take care of you. All your produce comes to us. To every man according to his need, from each man according to his ability. That's their ultimate dream, and that's the, exactly the way Karl Marx put it. You remember, I, I've been speaking constantly about there being a two-ness to the world. There's a male and a female. There's day and night. There's good and evil. There's light and darkness. There's heat and cold. And uh, some of these things have a spectrum. Others are digital. They are just what they are. These are not the only things. These aren't the only things that are dual. 
You see, I'm going to come back to that and, and lay this out for you. But be aware that the other things that are also dual and also work in twos uh, are, are how human society is arranged. That's very important. Let me explain. How many different ways do we have of arranging human society? Well, we have no arrangement at all. That's total anarchy. And nobody really likes that. Then we've got a vision of America's founders, which is based on a biblical, what I call an Abrahamitic view of society. And then we have a centralized tyranny, where a centralized government takes control of more and more of people's lives. That's the Tower of Babel model, built by Nimrod. So that's a Nimrodian style of life. And if you're interested in how socialism grew out of the Tower of Babel, and you want a clear understanding of what 11 verses in chapter 9 of Genesis, or is it 9 verses in chapter 11 of Genesis, rather, um, teach, then you'd go to my website at rabbidaniellappin.com and uh, download yourself a two-hour audio teaching called the Tower of Babel, right? Decoding the Secrets of Babel. The Tower of Power, Decoding the Secrets of Babel. And power, yes, because socialism is every bit as powerful as the other. It's powerful in a destructive way, whereas the Abrahamic model is powerful in a positive way, but the power is the power. And so um, uh, those are two of the ways of organizing society, right? Absolutely nothing, just nihilistic anarchy. Uh, then there is the Abrahamic view of responsible freedom and ownership of property, the centralized tyranny, which is socialism, based on the Tower of Babel. And, uh, and that's about it, right? The, the, there's not a lot of different ways of organizing human society. What everyone agrees on is that the first one of anarchy is intolerable. No organization at all, nobody wants. And that's one of the reasons that after anarchy, people often accept dictatorships. They accept tyranny. There was anarchy in Italy that brought in Mussolini. There was anarchy in Germany, horrible anarchy. It was a mess, and that brought in Hitler. You remember the old joke that uh, at least Mussolini made the trains run on time, and Hitler, yes, he organized things and made peace in the streets and the trains ran on time. Yes, he killed millions of people, Stalin also, but he restored order, and human beings do not like living in a state of civil chaos and anarchy. So as you rule that out, that leaves only three possibilities. Tribalism, Abrahamic, and Nimrodism. And here's the problem with tribalism. If you're not born into the right tribe, things do not go quite as well for you. That's the problem with tribalism. It's not a great way to organize society. There's something else wrong with tribalism, which is that no tribal society has figured out how to build a bicycle factory, let alone a chip fabrication plant. Tribal societies don't progress. They don't achieve very much. Unless you happen to be in a tribal society and you happen to be in the ruling tribe and you're having a wonderful time. Other than that, in that situation, almost everyone else says, you know what, given a choice, I don't think I want to live in a tribal society. So when you rule out anarchy and you rule out tribalism, there's really only two other ways to organize human society. Abraham and Nimrod. Freedom self-accountability, independence, economic ownership, privacy, or alternatively, centralized government, tyranny, increased government control, diminished freedom, diminished independence, no private ownership of wealth. That, my friends, is the choice. Again, we've got this two-ness going on. Those are the two choices. It's one or the other. And you need to know what the people around you are believing, because that is going to change the society in which you live, right? If, if you live, let's say you're a very quiet, considerate family, and you and your spouse and your children, you don't shout, you don't scream, you don't play your musical instruments very loud late at night, you don't throw no noisy parties late at night, you're an ideal neighbor, you really are. And then all of a sudden, little by little, into your neighborhood, first one side of you, then the neighbor on the other side, and then more elsewhere on the block, little by little move people who are exactly the opposite. 
noisy all hours of the day no consideration uh the their front lawn looks like a garbage heap they throw trash on the streets they put an old mattress out on the sidewalk and little by little all of that's going on and you say you know i don't care about my neighbors i know how i live nobody would say that because you're wrong your life is being ruined because the people around you are infecting your life it's unavoidable you can't be immune to it well that's what we're talking about when a lot of people around you start believing in a secular worldview a lot of people around you become more and more believing of the belief system that says that we arrived on this planet by a cosmological accident and a random occurrence and a lot more and more people as a result of that start becoming socialists inevitably please understand this secularism produces socialism that's inevitable and so as you start getting rid of judeo-christian biblical faith in a society you're going to start getting more and more socialism and what one of the exciting things i'm seeing in africa right now in many countries around africa is that christianity is experiencing a huge growth and as a result the socialism that was presented during the or immediately following the period of european colonialism that socialism that came about and it did come about i mean it was the period of the 1960s and this was um you know swinging london right um the the beatles and the uh, and all the the british pop groups and um and, you know the swinging london i mean this is this was a great time right to be young and to be in london the trouble is that that kind of um uh, effervescence that made life in london at that period uh, so exciting for young people well it didn't extend beyond the worlds of art and entertainment and it didn't extend outside london the economy of england was a very very sick old man and um, it was deteriorating rapidly years of uh, national health had sapped uh, the government, uh, the productivity was down, union power was totally out of control. And so economically, England was an absolute mess. Remember, this is before Margaret Thatcher. And at the same time, uh, because of the weakening economy, England is trying to get out of its colonial obligations. Um, contrary to what many people today tell you, that namely um, colonialism brought huge wealth to the colonial powers, the actual actuality is really the reverse. Um, the, uh, it, the colonialism was a huge expense to England, and a careful examination of the writing of the time will show that colonialism was undertaken only partly for mercantile reasons but partially to spread the gospel they really they wanted to spread christianity it was a totally noble purpose they wanted to bring civilization to africa and uh, and at this point with with the country reeling with debts of world war ii and the uh, and the cultural deterioration and the growth of socialism in england uh, they needed out and so the african countries now were trying to figure out what to do now, Karl Marx writes that socialism can only come about after industrialization and modernization has happened. That's when a society is ready and ripe for socialism. And what, the reason is pretty obvious, right? There has to have been wealth created. Socialism won't create wealth. It'll just redistribute what there is. And so if there is nothing, there's nothing. And so obviously they need to, socialism needs a, uh, a bed of industrialization and commercialization in order to succeed in africa however um the the people that began to emerge in africa and this happened in many countries you know ghana nigeria kenya Tan tanganyika um zanzibar uh did i say kenya uganda all of these countries pretty much the same story happened 
And uh, <clears throat> one of what happened is the British selected somebody from one of the ruling chief's family to send to school in England and to prepare for a role in government. And so in Tanzania, it was Julius Nyerere. And um, in uh, Kenya, it was uh, the man who uh, started the Mau Mau terrorist insurgency. <clears throat> Pardon me. And in um, Nyasaland, it was um, uh, Mabanda and Kaunda. And all of these guys were sent to England to, to school. When they finished school, they went off to university. And so Nyeri, for example, ended up in the University of Edinburgh. But it didn't matter whichever English university they ended up in. All they got was exactly what you'd get in a university in America today, which was a, an incessant diet of um, unmodified socialism. That's what they got. So they all listened to these people who they took to be the leading intellectuals of the West, and they heard them saying there is no private property. Private property is the source of all evil and everything has to be community owned. They look at each other and they say, hey, back home in our tribe, everyone did own anything. There was no private property in much the same way as early American Indians had no private property. It is a very primitive condition. And, uh, <clears throat> and because there was no private property, there was very little in the way of enterprise, right? In Africa, prior to the, uh, the colonial arrival, uh, there wasn't written language. There was no scientific development. It didn't exist in Africa. And, um, and again, you know, <laughs> you're probably not supposed to say this stuff today, right? You're supposed to lie and make up fantasies uh, that more closely fit the political correctness of 2021. But uh, again, anybody who's interested in exploring it honestly and um, and soundly will, will realize that this is what happened. And so these uh, African leaders growing up and coming of age in, in British universities say, hey, this is fantastic. We're being told all these years we thought from the colonials we're primitive, we have to become westernized, we have to become modern. Now we're discovering, hey, we're halfway there already. This idea of no private property, we had it. So all we need now is is the rest of it, public ownership of everything. And so um, Neri and all his colleagues came back to Africa during the 60s. And at this point, the Russians found themselves in very welcome uh, fertile ground and they were warmly embraced and so the Russians uh, the Soviets if you like established a very strong foothold in Africa because of this commonality of socialism which they encouraged and um, and little by little uh, socialism became the order of the day and literally ruined the economic prospects of most African countries for decades uh, because of nationalization of everything, everything came to a standstill. Basically, you quickly run out of money. <clears throat> you very quickly run out of money to redistribute. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what happens. So sure enough, for many years, uh, economic development in Africa was disastrous. And it still hasn't fully recovered. But one of the most exciting things happening in Africa right now is the rapid spread of Christianity. Uh, it is outpacing Islam in Africa. But here's the best part. If you superimpose on a map of Africa the hotspots of evangelical Christian activity, and on that you superimpose another mylar overlay of the hotspots of economic entrepreneurialism and wealth creation, you won't be at all surprised to see a complete congruence. Yes, that's the point believing in scientific secularism produces socialism, which produces misery and poverty for everybody. And conversely, a revival of fervent, serious Christianity, Bible-believing Christianity, causes a resurgence of an Abramitic society and an Abramitic economy. There is a reason why Jews have always been disproportionately good with money because monetary success and biblical faith 
actually do go hand in hand. Now, I, mean, I know this, this is very shocking information for many people, and I know that uh, for many people who listen to this, uh, they're going to be goaded into furious indignation at what I dare to say, but I'm not, I'm not, trying, to, I'm not trying to bludgeon anybody with this. I'm just telling you how it is, and you are free to label me a deluded idiot or a teller of the truth. But, but don't make that decision intuitively. Make it after you've researched some of the things I've been telling you about for yourself. And you will see that there is a tunus in the world, and the choice is either God-centric or materialistic. And there are two economies. There's a centralized tyranny, and there's an Abramidic economy. Now, admittedly, there is something of a uh, spectrum there. You have countries moving towards centralized tyranny or moving towards a bromidic economy, as I'm seeing in much of Africa. It's one of the reasons I find visiting in Africa now so very exciting and why this, uh, the, this period of COVID restriction is, uh, is so aggravating to me, particularly because uh, not one but two planned trips to Africa had to be put on hold. You know, the prospect of sitting on an airplane for 11 hours with a mask on is just, frankly, utterly intolerable. And so uh, there, there it is. That's, that's what's going on. So, uh, so remember then, if you rule out anarchy, which nobody likes, and you rule out tribalism, which is pretty horrible if you're not in the ruling tribe, the only two other ways are Abraham and Nimrod. Freedom, self-accountability, independence, economic ownership, privacy. Alternatively, you can go the materialistic way. Centralized government, socialism, tyranny, increased government control, diminished freedom, diminished independence, no private ownership of wealth. That is the choice. Now, for just a moment, let's go back to the cow and the farmer talking. You remember that little thought experiment there? And the farmer says, sorry, I'm the farmer. You'll give me everything in exchange for which I'll take care of all your needs. This is the kind of deal that centralized government tyrannies make with their citizens. You work, you get what you need to keep body and soul together, but everything else belongs to us. That's what they say. And so the farmer is a very good metaphor for that centralized governmental role. So is the zookeeper, by the way. What does a responsible zookeeper do when after he feeds the lions, he comes back a few hours later and notices that one big old lion has gathered all the meat that he gave out to the rest of the lions in one big huge pile in front of him. He's keeping all the other lions away. They're hungry. He's got all the meat. What does a responsible zookeeper do? If he discovers that when he put out all the feed for the elephants, one elephant gathered all the feed to himself, all the other elephants sitting around looking hungrily at the big elephant who's taken all the food, well, the responsible zookeeper goes out and redistributes the meat. A responsible zookeeper goes out and redistributes the feed for the elephants. In other words, my dear happy warriors, I, Rabbi Daniel Lappin, your rabbi, if I were suddenly persuaded that uh, we are on this planet, not because God created us in his image and put us here. There's no God. But we're here through a cosmological accident. We're here through a process of unaided, random, materialistic evolution, and that we're nothing but sophisticated animals. I'll tell you, I will be the first to preach and practice redistribution of wealth, of everything. It's the only moral thing to do. If we are nothing but animals, that means we're incapable of creativity. If we're nothing but animals, it means that whatever food there is has to be hunted or gathered. And there's no reason why any one person animal should have any more than any other person animal. But if in fact, oh, and another thing we should also bear in mind, and that is that if we're animals, then we all have exactly the same needs and desires. Human beings are very different, right? With human beings, you've got, uh, you've got the human being who loves eating out in restaurants. You've got another human being who loves cooking at home. You've got another human being that loves sending his children to government indoctrination camps, gigs. I mean, sorry, public schools. And uh, you've got other human beings who love homeschooling. Every, there's uniqueness. That's why God gave us fingerprints. I don't call them fingerprints. I call them soul prints because they do dedicate themselves to the proposition that each one of us is a unique and different soul. So if you got hold of my DNA and you constituted and cloned a Rabbi Daniel Lappin, he'll look just like me. Unfortunately, it's just a reality. He will, but he won't be me. 
He won't think like me. He won't dream like me. He won't share the same aspirations I have because you cannot clone a soul. A soul is where our uniqueness lies. And so animals not having that, sure, every animal, every lion wants the same amount of meat proportional to his weight. Every elephant is a herbivore, wants the same amount of hay proportional to his weight. There is nothing else. And there is no innate animal desire to accumulate wealth. Obviously, uh, uh, squirrels that gather food and store it away for the winter because they're going to semi-hibernate, that's not gathering wealth. We all understand what that is, just to clarify. But persuade me that we're here because of a random accident where primitive protoplasm Uh, mutates and grows and evolves over billions of years uh, to become bookkeepers and ballerinas, as I say. If you tell me that, then I'm for redistribution because we're animals, and that's the only moral way for animals to behave. Zookeepers and farmers would have to do that and would do that. They're exactly right. So if we're nothing but animals, um, there's no reason why anyone should have any more than anyone else. But if, in fact, we're touched by the finger of God, And if, in fact, we are unique creatures called human beings, unique among all the creatures of the planet, and here because God placed nature there to serve us, and we're uniquely equipped to create and not just consume, and each of us has a soul, and with a soul comes a different way of evaluating the lazy food equation. Some people say, I'd rather sit under a tree and eat less. Other people say, I want to work very, very, very hard because I want to be able to eat more. Because if we have souls, each of us behaves in our own unique way. Animals all behave the same. Animal behavior. Animals do what animals do with each species. Human beings, a different story entirely. Well, what's this got to do with inheritance? Well, the way you answer that basic philosophical question of why or how human beings are here would have a lot to do with the inheritance tax that is applied to people's possessions when they pass on. Allow me to explain quickly. If indeed the answer to the existential question of how did we get to planet Earth, and the answer is that we're only here by a lengthy process of unaided, materialistic, random evolution, then that means we're nothing but animals, as I've said before. And it's pretty obvious, it's straightforward, it follows very simply that if primitive protoplasm became amoebas and amoebas turned into turtles and turtles became orangutans and orangutans turned into people, then people are just a little further advanced than orangutans. That's all. But we're basically animals. And if we're basically animals, then any specific special contact between us and our children is nothing but a false conceit. There's no truth to it. After all, When did you ever see a dog that recognized its puppies? When did you ever see a dog go up to another dog and say, hmm, aren't you my son? Talking about male dogs, right? Obviously, there's a connection between puppies and their mothers. But after a little while, even that goes away. There's no such thing. Even the connection between an animal and its mother uh, lasts for only a short while and then it's gone. But the idea that this particular creature, touched by the finger of God, retains a relationship between parent and child till life separates them, till death separates them, that's unique to humans. No other creature does it. A very awkward fact for materialists. People who shape their worldview based on a materialistic approach that everything is only biology and materialism, and nothing um, is real that can't be seen or tasted or touched or worn or driven, and that science explains everything everything and provides truth and you know right now the united states of america and other countries with the COVID thing are seeing a lot of that we must follow the science as if human beings have no other needs other than the scientific little by little now we start hearing of american governors saying you know the the loss and the suffering and in many cases the ill health that comes about through financial stress because we've closed up the economy hey you know what maybe that means something as well but you see They don't listen to that. They're only listening to the epidemiologists, right? And uh, that is how this damn panic began to spread. The whole damn panic is only a result of, oh, we're going to listen to the scientists. Yeah, if you are a materialist and nothing else matters, then those are the decisions you're going to make. And so here again, this is why it is so important that wherever you live, You have to know what people around you are believing because what they know 
is not nearly as important as what they believe. And so people who shape their worldview on materialism and uh, everything is biology and everything is science and everything is materialistic, then those people say, well, wait a second, when a human being dies, it shouldn't be any more relevant to his children than it is when a dog dies to his children. It's just not that relevant to them. You might say it's sad, but it's sad for everybody. The loss of a member of the community, another worker has gone, as well as a member of a tribe, it's same for everybody. And their approach is, look, it's totally wrong that when a person dies, only a tiny, tiny little group of children, namely those that are biologically related to him, should benefit. It's not right. Why should a man's possessions after he dies only go to his children? Right? We're one community. We are communities. We are communists. We are socialists. We're one group of people. No boundaries, no borders, no religions. We're one group of people. We're all animals in a sense. We're just sophisticated animals. And it's surely wrong for any one group to get more than any other group. The only way to treat the possessions of somebody who goes home to the Lord, the only way to deal with the possessions of somebody who dies, is to distribute his possessions among everybody else. Because that's not always practical, we'll have the zookeeper or the farmer take care of it for us. In other words, the government dream is a 100% death tax. Of course, the more polite name for this is the inheritance tax, but it's really a death tax. As you can tell, it is I, I know it to be a profoundly immoral thing, not only because the owner of that, the departed human being, has already paid taxes on all his money. It's his money. He's paid the taxes when he earned it. There was withholding, and he paid property taxes. He paid capital gains. Ta it's all been taxed. Now it's his, and he should be able to do whatever he wants with it. If he wants to give it to his children, they should go to, it should go to his children. But that only works if you believe that human beings are unique creatures touched by the finger of God. But as long as you believe that human beings are absolutely nothing but animals, and we're just sophisticated animals, then there is no particular relationship between people and their children. It's just a biological one. As soon as your children are grown up, just the way when a puppy is developed, it can have nothing more to do with its parents, so it is with human beings. Move right along there, fella. By the way, that is why in the early days of Israel, the kibbutz movement took children away from their parents and raised them by the kibbutz in a sort of group area, because the idea was to shatter the relationship between parents and children. That was the goal. It was the idea, that's what they were trying to do, to separate. And that's why it was that in the Stalinist era in Russia, there were rewards and honors for any children that turned in their parents, betrayed their parents. You remember, farmers were supposed to hand in everything they grew. It was supposed to be handed in. In other words, 100% taxation, like the farmer and the cow. Stalin arranged and ruled that every farmer has to hand in everything he grows, and then the local communist apparatus will determine how much each person is, uh, is, is, is going to get. It's all divided up. That's how it worked. And there were some farmers who either felt that they had grown it and worked hard for their crops and they wanted to keep enough for their families before they handed in the rest. Uh, then their children betrayed them, and those children were rewarded, and the parents were executed. Um, during the days of the Soviet Union, they had many statues of a little boy called Pavlik Morozov. He was a member of the Young Pioneer Movement, which was like the Communist Boy Scouts. And he famously, treacherously betrayed his parents. He told the local communist apparatus that his parents were keeping back some of the farm food for the family. They were not being good communists. They didn't hand it all in like they were told. And so the parents were executed. And little Pavlik Morozov was honored and, uh, and, uh, and, and praised by the state. Uh, soon after that, one of the uncles, one of his uncles killed him. And there was a revenge going on. Then that uncle was executed. But they put up statues of this little boy. Dividing, causing a gap between parents and children is what socialism wants to do. It's part of the entire purpose of public education is to undermine the relationship between parents and children. 
And that's one of the reasons that it's terribly difficult in countries with socialistically styled public education like the United States of America, it's very difficult for families to discover what their children are actually being told in school because there are policies designed to keep them in the dark. Part of socialism is driving a wedge between children and parents. It must happen. Socialism philosophically is disturbed by this notion that human beings are different and that animals have no contact with their children but human beings do no we're just animals as well and we also have no contact onwards with our children socialism dedicated to uh, wrecking that uh, the other part of it obviously is being able to impose 100 percent inheritance tax which would be a huge boon for government finances and um, another part of it yet, of course, is to have greater control. In other words, if children are going to tend to believe or listen to the state more than their parents, then that's good for socialism. If they listen to the parents more than the state, that's bad for socialism. And so uh, we have to understand that one of the big areas in which how God created us is relevant and whether we evolve materialistically is relevant, it's on this question of the inheritance tax, right? And, and so those of us who believe that God created us in his image, we believe the government has nothing to do with it. The government's out of it. When a man dies, his property goes to his children. Keep the farmer and the zookeeper out of it. Uh, he'll give it to his wife, his widow, it'll be the children. It's nobody else's business. But the materialistic worldview says, no, wait a second. When he dies, like an animal dies, all the stuff he's left behind is not his. He doesn't own it anymore. He doesn't exist anymore. If it's not his, whose is it? <laughs> well, it's the state, obviously. It belongs to everybody. And as an agent of everybody, the government will take control of it. And that is why the real dream that the Labour government in England lived this dream after World War II, 100% inheritance tax. Everything that a person leaves when he dies children what do you mean children everyone's children should benefit not just yours and that's why it is that if anybody confides in me whether he, whether he believes that we are here as the result of unaided materialistic evolution or that if that person tells me that he believes we, that uh, we're here on uh, b because of god i will know where he stands on the inheritance tax it's almost inevitable it's absolutely normal it's absolutely natural how about the area of sex? If we're created by God and we are unique creatures touched by the finger of God, then the first few chapters of Genesis are a wonderful and divine sex manual. Those chapters tell us everything we need to know about male-female relationships. We understand that a good and loving God provided us with an entire approach on how to relate to someone of the opposite gender. And there's a thing called marriage between a man and woman. And that is something that civilizes man and is good for women. It creates the appropriate environment for their children. What's more, God made the interaction between male and female pleasurable in order to help us understand that the deepest joy in life is doing something for another person. And we begin to understand that the entire area of physical intimacy is endowed with the sacred. It's part of the way we have of connecting with God when you think about it. What would be the best way of getting to know a musician? Let's imagine you really, really like the late Freddie Mercury of Queen, a British band from the 70s. If you could have your choice, you'd love to spend an evening having dinner with Freddie Mercury. There's only one problem, and that is he's dead, so you cannot have dinner with him. So how do you express your infatuation with Freddie Mercury? There's only one thing to do, and that's to get to know his work. Because if you surround yourself with these creations and you absorb them and wrap yourself around them and make them a part of your life, that's as close as you can get to Freddie Mercury. Think about this. You want to get close to the Creator? It's one of the deepest subconscious desires we have to get close to God. And that's why I keep on telling people that uh, faith is one of the five F's. Everyone knows they need friends. Everyone needs, knows they need finances. Everyone knows they need fitness. Um, everyone knows they need family. But not everyone knows they need faith. People think it's an accident. Oh, I don't have any faith. Lucky you, lucky you were born into faith. No, I wasn't. I got it myself. Um, you need faith just like you need fitness, just like you need finances. People don't realize that. Uh, they think faith is like a virus, right? You catch it uh, and you can get inoculated or vaccinated against it. No, it's not true. We all have a deep subconscious desire to get close to God. 
it's really tough. It's not as if you can invite God to dinner, not if you can go for a walk with God. So what's the best way? Get to know his creation. You can study the world, you can study science, you can study physics. Little by little, you'll begin to see the unity in creation. And you will begin to connect with what God is, and your relationship with him becomes strengthened. You know why? Or let me put it, you know what, what, what is a great uh, piece of evidence of what I've just told you? Which part of universities are most socialistic? The science, technology, engineering, mathematics, physics, biology, chemistry departments? In other words, the science and math departments or the liberal arts departments? You know the answer, right? It's clear. Socialism has totally evaded the liberal arts departments. Literature, gender studies, uh, philosophy, uh, psychology, all of that has become uh, leftist politicized. But why why not the science departments? Because, first of all, in the science departments, there's a reality. You can't bend reality to your private wishes, right? Because the uh, position of an electron in a certain element or an electron's proclivity, an element's proclivity to seize another electron or to relinquish another electron, it doesn't surrender to your choice. It does what it does. And so there's a reality, and reality connects you with faith because that is real. And reality keeps you away from socialism because it's unreal. Anyway, if you can't study, rea- if you can't study the world, uh, or for wh- for whatever reason it is, you want another way to get to know God. You can look at the apex of His creation. It's all very well looking at mountains and lakes and rivers and trees, but how about looking at another human being? That's the ultimate of God's creation. It's like Freddie Mercury's best song, right? How do you do this? Well, you get to know another person. And that's why God uses in the Bible the phrase, and he knew her. Cain knew his wife. Please don't think that's just a poetic euphemism. No, that is there to tell us that the physical intimacy is at the heart of getting to know another person and that it brings one of the greatest joys and pleasures in life is getting to know another person. She knows him, he knows her. That's the essence of it. And in so doing, they both come to know a little bit of God. That's one of the reasons that, if if I can just put it this way, at the height of passion, people very often tend to use religious language almost involuntarily. Oh, God, is because there's this deep realization deep within our souls that by getting to know this other person in such a soul-bearing and and incredible way, this other person created by our good and loving God, we are actually getting a deeper insight into the Creator who created them. This is why it is that to people who view us as the children of God, sex is sacred. But to people who believe that we're here just through a materialistic process of unaided evolution, sex is secular. It's just biological. Guess who's in charge of the curriculum at public schools? I mean, government indoctrination camps, GICs. We're accustomed to calling them public schools, but I don't think that's absolutely accurate. I prefer GIC. Anyway, um, sex ed is being taught in public schools, in GICs. And who's in charge of the curriculum? Well, guess. Because sex ed is all about biology. Because they truly, and in a very real way, believe that's the whole story. There is not anything else. The word sacred is absurd. And if there isn't anything else, it's pretty clear, isn't it? Isn't it clear that that's sex, that's what it's all about? That's why it's that if you tell me how you believe on the question of how human beings arrived on the planet, I will tell you what you think about sex. It's pretty predictable. And that's remarkable. So, um, I... uh, think that that is about as far as we will go for today's program. It's quite long enough, and I I hope that uh, you've been able to listen to it in easily digestible slices. Um, I want to make sure that you all do get a chance to become a happy warrior. As I said, you can go to the website wehappywarriors.com, wehappywarriors.com, or you can just go to the rabbidaniellappin.com site. You you might want to look at the... um, Uh, at the program I told you about, Tower of Power, Decoding the Secrets of Babel, 
which is the origins of the socialism that we see around us today. And you have to understand what people are buying into, what they're believing. Uh, you might also want to enjoy the delightful little video of uh, How to Bake Challah, filmed by Susan in Susan's Kitchen. And uh, you will want to also get hold of the ebook called The Holistic You. The Holistic You. All of that necessary for you to be able to thrive. Look, uh, things are not simple. I'm taping this in the early months, in the early spring of 2021. And um, uh, it's, you know, it's not, things are not looking clear. Things are not looking smooth and easygoing. But you still have to take care of your life. Nobody else, not the government, not the school teachers, not the bureaucrats. Nobody else cares about your life as much as you do. Nobody else cares as much about your family as you do. And so focus on your five F's. Take care and be aware that in the week ahead, I will be praying that you are able to really build your family, your faith. Yes, your faith also, your finances, your friendships, and your physical fitness. Until next week, I'm your rabbi, Rabbi Daniel Lappin. God bless.